Tour is now broadcasting to all attendees. <laughs> it's the most exciting announcement of all time. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes for people to get into the webinar because while it is broadcasting to all attendees, all attendees need a minute to get in. Um, so hello. Uh, this is the fun part. I'm just going to vamp. It's going to be like, this will be great. Um, yeah, just doing something, just starting here. We could, we could just be super fun and just do this. And just wait and see how long it takes for people to tweet and be like, it's not working. Um, which they would because they're lovely and they care about us. Um, but yeah, hi, hello. I'm going to start and then everyone's going to join us because otherwise this is just really weird and no one wants that. Um, it's me, Lindsay, and today my book is out and I'm really excited. Look, I have it. Oh, Pona went away. Pona <laughs> went away. I'm just going to keep turning around every two minutes because I forgot to put don't go off screen. Um, that's a good start. That lets you know where you're at and what level of technical proficiency you should expect from today. Um, thank you for joining us. I've got notes on my phone because I am somewhat professional, but not really. The BIM man is also on his way. So I just feel like I should mention the glamour of this evening will include you hearing our bins going out. Um, but thank you for joining us. It's publication day. In case you missed it, it's out now in the UK. Ah, um, can't quite believe it. Um, I hope wherever you're celebrating that you are celebrating. Um, I've got a second can of wine. Not my second today, <laughs> but second after I had a can of wine on my event with G the other day and it was very popular. So I just wanted to expand on the story of American cans of wine. It's a big thing. Everyone's doing it. It's the democratization of wine. It's very exciting. So I'm going to have some canned wine. It's a lot of wine. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to introduce my pals because otherwise I'll be drunk and like we should definitely do it before then. Um, first up, we've got Porna Bell. Hi. Who's an award-winning journalist, an author, a digital expert, and a competitive powerlifter. Which is very, I know. I'm like, Mm, thank you. Um, no, that's true. You're all those things and like loads more, but I thought we'd summarize it and get into the rest of it later. Um, I'm so happy that you're here. I was like such a big fan of your writing forever and um, we actually share an agent and forever I would hang out with my agent. She'd be like, you've got to meet Porter though, but you've got to meet Porter though. But I'm like, well, do that then. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to do it. I am an awkward human. Um, and then when I found out you were a power lifter as well, fully developed into an inappropriate crush because I also lift um yeah. so we're going to talk about that a little bit and then we also have in my top left corner I don't know where she is in your corner it's so hard to say <laughs> we've got Olivia Purvis we've got Liv um from what Olivia did Liv is a blogger a podcaster an author and the founder of the Insecure Girls Club all those things and dog mother um oh. I assume she's still with us not yeah. like alive but like <laughs> literally with us <laughs> Maggie. <laughs> I don't know whether that was a bit like off piece. No, it was, the per it was perfect. Um, I got into a lot of trouble for not bringing the cats into the chat that I did with G um, on Tuesday. And it was only because they are terrifying monsters, as you two both saw in our preview chat last week. Um, that was not ideal. So the door is open. They might come in, but fingers crossed they won't. Um, Liv, I actually, this is, again, I'm going to be creepy because I was looking for an email um, for this event so that I could check all the stats. And I found the first email that we ever exchanged. And it was in 2012. Oh my God. Was it me fangirling a lot? It was, but like, <laughs> I'm very into that. So it was fine. Oh, I printed it out, put it on my wall. I just put it under my pillow and I look at it at night. No, um, because we met at a book signing, I think. And you had yeah. said you were going to email me. And I was like, yeah, email me. <laughs> um and then my friend was like her boyfriend's really fit which now I'm like it's a bit awkward because now you're married to him um, but he remains really fit so congrats uh but yeah I was like eight years that's crazy oh, and so much has happened in that time I'm still a bit so um yeah well you are all you're all of the good things you're all of the good things and we've got the same drawers from West Elm which is exciting <laughs> it, that's all it takes for me I'm like that means we're soulmates like Porna picks up heavy things and me and Liv have got the same drawers that's all it takes and we are now literally best friends um we're gonna chat about the book that's out and some people have already messaged me say they've already finished it which is really scary um because it took ages to write it <laughs> and it took you like three hours to read it which I'm very impressed um but we're gonna talk about that we're not gonna do spoilers but we are gonna talk about some of the themes and parts of the book 
I'm going to disclose that I haven't washed my hair. Just don't need to touch on that again. Um, Cause I did get dressed and, and I put on makeup and I've sent Jeff outside. So <laughs> he's going to think about himself and we're going to think about book stuff. So this is very exciting. Um, jumping in because otherwise it's just gonna be me shouting at the two of you uh, for an hour one of the reasons I really wanted the two of you here um, to talk today um, especially about this book is you have created two of my favorite corners of the internet corner um, with see my strong and live with insecure girls club um, I feel like we are still in a transition phase with how much women are allowed to feel and be and be comfortable with it and you have both created safe spaces where you can be something that isn't always allowed physically strong and mentally vulnerable like it's polar opposites but it's two sides of the same coin like both of those things are important um so i just want to talk about that a little bit before we start porna can you tell us a little bit about Seema strong yeah, it's um so it's a community that I've created on Instagram and um it kind it sort of it came around the same time that I'd probably started uh powerlifting for about I would say like 6 to 7 months maybe. So uh for anyone listening who doesn't know what powerlifting is uh because I had no clue what it was um is where basically you uh you competitively lift um the heaviest weights that you can possibly handle. Um, which are like a squat bench and deadlift. And I will talk so that Lindsay can open her can of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just adding some ASMR sound effects. Sorry. I'm like, and I've even put it in there in case you missed it, Mark. Which is, yeah. I'm like, look. Um, <laughs> opening the wine. <laughs> But it was it. It basically came came around the same time when I'd started to uh, lift really heavy. Which Lindsay, you know, you you will know uh, some of this because you've spoken about it and written about it. Which is just that it was really hard to navigate a sense of identity of wanting to just lift really heavy things, and to kind of yeah. move away from fitness, which for me was always about yeah. I mean yeah, cool. You know, mentally, uh, you know, I enjoyed it, but it was still always about like you know, trying to kind of keep as small as possible and always having this kind of yeah. thing around like weight maintenance in the back of your head. And, um, and I really struggled with it on social media because everyone's kind of feed that I seem to come across, you know, it was like a very particular body type. If you were muscly, it, you were still like super feminine. And I really struggled with that. And it then kind of also struck me that a lot of us, um, you know, work out for mental health reasons, like we come to it from mental health and actually there are really massive representations of fitness that a lot of us don't see because the conversation is dictated by what you see in like mainstream fitness advertising or like you know yeah like the, the sort of the big accounts that you see on instagram and i just i just got really tired of it i got i got really fed up with it and i just thought you know i can't be the only one that thinks like this i know i'm not the only one that thinks like this so I was just like, actually, I just want to kind of create this space, like even if it's a really tiny space to tell the stories of women, because we like, you know, we don't all have one story, you know, we've got many different facets to us. Um, and if you sort of come to, to some type of exercise, you probably have a story around it that's like quite personal and probably quite deep. And I just wanted to tell that story. I just wanted to tell the stories of women um, and non-binary people who wanted to kind of chart that. And it ended up creating this community where people, I think, just feel quite safe, which is not how people always feel with social media, um, and where you can kind of talk about the stuff that maybe you haven't really spoken about with other people before, because it is a safe space to do that. And also you're framing it within achievement and ongoing progress. And it's just been, it's just, I'm really surprised that it's meant to, meant so much to people in the way that it has, because it means a lot to me, but I'm just like one person. But yeah, it's, it's just, it's something that gives me a lot of joy at the moment. Yeah, I think it's amazing, honestly, because um, similar to you, I got into it a couple of years ago and um, I went from being someone who was so against any sort of workouts because I was always bigger and like I've been bigger. I, mean, I, I hate to say all these phrasing, but like I was heavier than I am now when I was younger. I lost about 40 pounds when I was in my 20s, which was a health decision because I have a family of heart disease and I was like you know what like this is just not healthy for your heart why put it at more risk like no shame on what anyone wants to be be whatever you are um but for me that was a personal health decision 
And then I decided I need to step it up and also become active. Like I literally used to make a joke every Lent that I was giving up extraneous exercise. Like I was like, that's what we're giving up this year, moving unnecessarily. Um, and then I realized that was not as cute as I thought it was. Mm. And maybe I should start working out. And I tried so many different things and I just never enjoyed it. I got into running a little bit and injured my knee. I got into spinning and hurt my back. I was just like, this is, I'm cursed. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. I liked yoga, but it wasn't really giving me enough of a health benefit for what I wanted. And then weirdly I got into, no one listening to this is surprised, but I got into lifting through professional wrestling because I'm a massive wrestling fan. And all the, when this started to happen, when I was getting into fitness again, it was when the women in professional wrestling and the mainstream professional wrestling were starting to change from being sort of bikini models, hitting each other with pillowcases to being like badass athletes who looked amazing, performed amazingly. And when I started following them on social media, they were all lifting. And I genuinely, as someone who spent considerable amounts of time in a gym, had no idea that that was an option for me. Like I just didn't know. And as soon as I started doing it, immediately I was like, this is my thing, this is my thing. And I love it and I feel strong and I can carry my suitcases upstairs. And like, my proudest moment was when a taxi driver met me at a hotel and he was taking me back to the airport and he was like, oh, well, let me get those suitcases for you. And he picked it up and he was like, oh my God, what's in this? And I was like, let me, <laughs> let me help you. And I was so proud because I didn't, I think you also, also, because you're in isolation so much as a woman lifting, you don't really know how strong you are or what your achievements are. And I am someone that minimizes my achievements because that's what I was raised to do mm -hmm. in a sense. So I just didn't really know. And those little moments where you're like, I've done a thing and this is amazing. And you've created that space for it. And it's so amazing. Thank you. Like, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, and Liv, I'm going to ask you the same question about Insecure Girls Club. Like, how did we get there? And I see a very beautiful book right up here behind me. <laughs> um, kind of similar to what Corner said in the sense that it started from wanting to create a space where people, sorry, traffic, um, could talk about things that perhaps they hadn't felt they had the space to talk about almost sometimes anonymously or just discuss things that perhaps sometimes felt trivial, I think, with insecurities. Some of the, I mean, it's basically, it started, let's start at the beginning. It started from having lots of different conversations with friends where lots of the topics that kind of come up in the books are about friendship and work and comparison and the life, different life stages. So the website kind of accommodates some people like finishing uni and feeling like, oh, I don't want to go to uni. What should I do next? Or people that are leaving a job or getting married or not getting married. And I think all those different life stages where you kind of are looking sideways and going, oh my God. Um, and I was having lots of conversations like that with friends. I think it's, I think everyone has those. Um, and because I've been sharing my life on my blog for the last 10 years, I've kind of been touching on those topics it kind of felt like all of the times I was discussing those things, it felt secondary, like it didn't feel like, it felt like a bit of an afterthought. And I thought I really want to give more attention and a space to these topics and actually speak to more women. I love interviewing people. That's that, you know, that's how I got into, got into that. <laughs> I, love, I mean, albeit that, that interview was probably a little bit more surface level. Um, but I love talking. I thought, to it was ex I thought it was expert. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> but I've always loved doing that, whether that's on YouTube or the blog. And I just wanted to kind of explore those things more in a space that didn't feel secondary, didn't feel rushed, didn't feel compromised by different amounts of content. I think, I don't know, like it's, it's so interesting. I think with what I do, I think people kind of assume that, that, you know, it's all glamour and you've got it all together. And I think there is that on social media in general. Um, and it was just nice to be able to have these conversations and equally not be the forefront of them. Because I think equally when you write a blog, it's about you. It's, it's about my life and it's about what I'm wearing all the rest of it, which is lovely. But I didn't want to be the face of all these topics where I'm just one woman, with one experience. I wanted it to be a conversation where someone who's had a completely different lived experience to me could say oh I've had this experience and have a space to share it if they haven't got a platform um and that started with like interviewing a few friends and then it just we opened the, the platform up submissions started a website and it's just kind of gone from there and we're constantly working on to how like how to make it more efficient and more like inclusive and everything and it's just it's just been like a really lovely corner to kind of 
have people talking about things that some people you know you think are trivial like I think mm-hmm. I've spoken about pubic care and things I'm just like oh this is stupid I couldn't write this anywhere but actually everything's valid and everything's there's space for everything on the site and that's kind of why I started it I guess yeah but that's it's that's the thing I think I think especially as women and as non-binary people we are not us as non-binary but as women and non-binary people we are um programmed to trivialize things and we are programmed to minimize our experiences and society tells us that our experience isn't as important you know it's like we're we're trained to keep it in and keep it quiet and it's very much in line with what Fauna was saying about staying physically small you know we're also trained to keep emotionally tight and like it's better to keep things together and it's better to just control it and I think it's a very British thing to be like I'll just take care of it it's gonna be fine like we'll deal with this um and yeah when I first start again like let's how can I make this about me um when I first started talking about mental health online it, I was really surprised because I was like oh no one wants to hear this from me like there's enough people talking about it no one cares like I think um Zoella Zoe Sug was talking about it a lot at the time and her anxiety and her experiences with anxiety and suddenly it seemed like everyone was talking about it and I totally kicked into that defensive thing where I'm like well no one cares about your version of this and like enough people are talking about it. Now everyone's talking about it. So it's not important. But I think it's really important that everyone can just be totally, totally honest about it. Because when you bury stuff down, there's the bin mem, it makes it like so much worse when it bubbles back up. And like, I've been in therapy for not totally, nothing to do with the fact that it's when you send that email, Liv, but like for about eight years. Um, <laughs> like it's about the same time I've been in and out of therapy. I have medication for my anxiety. Like, it comes and it goes, it's good and it's bad. And it's like, I just think we've got to talk about it. Porno, I know you've talked a lot about mental health as well and that you've got a lot of experience about this. What were your experiences when you first started getting into it? I mean, so my, I come from a very specific experience, which was that my late husband had depression and also uh, dealt with addiction. So for me, like those were two massive kind of areas and intersections that even so for example like they don't move at the same time so whilst um you know people were talking about depression let's say and the journey began around destigmatizing it you know addiction is still very much hugely taboo and we haven't you know really moved anywhere near as as fast as we should do and it's really difficult because we have a government in the uk you know as as does the us which um which has various policies and language around how they talk about things that makes destigmatizing things around it super hard right but um what i kind of found was before i started talking about all of this stuff i was just absolutely terrified because you know like yourself like both of you i i assume that this was stuff that you kind of just very much kept to yourself and you know didn't necessarily really talk to that many people who knew you let alone like on a public platform about it but for me the the moment yeah it was exactly that actually when i when I, so the first time i ever wrote anything about rob um i thought oh my god but what if i kind of thought oh my god what if i get trolled for this but also oh my god what if no one reads it like what if no one cares and maybe actually why should anyone care and it turned out that actually a lot of people care because even if it's not the same story that's happened to them you as an individual represents so many different intersections for other people. So mm-hmm. for example, you know, um, it's not just about your visible intersections. I mean, for me, it's, it's really important being South Asian, being someone who talks about mental health because, you know, in my community, we're still so really far behind when it comes to that conversation. But also, you know, you represent someone who has been a success at certain things in life and so for the person who kind of hears your story and who's like oh my god Lindsay's like gone through this or Liv's gone through this or Prana's gone through this and they kind of like seem to be really confident and they have it together and they do this and they do that I think that's why it's really important because even if in your own brain you're you have this like I like for me I'm like permanently stuck between the ages of like 15 to like maybe 25 and um and so when so sometimes i'm not always like that but generally that, that that's <laughs> not setting right so when someone kind of like tells me i've like done stuff i'm like oh okay or when they say like actually you spoke about this thing or you um you wrote about this thing i i forget because you don't live outside of yourself all the time you kind of live in your own brain which for me is like very much like 90s to mid 20s i know i need to move on 
Uh, much like the no, character. Is entirely fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go, oh, oh, she's a professional. <laughs> she did. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm the same. I always, everyone used to say to me when I was younger, because I was the youngest in my family. And then when I started working in publishing, I was the youngest in my job. And then I was the youngest editor. And then I was, got my book deal at like yeah. 27, 28. But it was, I was younger, always younger. Mm. And now as I'm getting older, like when I was younger, everyone was like, I just feel like you were born 30. I just feel like you were born 30. And then like, once I passed 30, it was like, it's, it's time to move on now. And I was like, it's not, you know, it's actually time to regress. It's time to go back. Uh, it's time to sit down with two adults and discuss how excited I am about the Kissing Boo 2 and the new Taylor Swift album and to own it and enjoy it and like have that be the best thing that's happened to me ever. Um, also, just to side note, because I could not mention it, is Taylor Swift produced and written with The National Aaron Dessner of the National. So it's literally my two best things come together. That's why I'm so excited today. Anyway, um, <laughs> she knew. I'm not saying she knew, but maybe she knew. I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's possible. Um, but yeah, I, I, that same thing where I think you get a, a, an idea in your head of who and what you are. And then when you are forced away from it or pulled back from it, it's very unsettling. Mm. Like my anxiety really my, I, I've always had it I didn't know like I just didn't know what it was I just thought that was how I was and I remember I went out for dinner with two friends and they bought me it was like a joke Christmas like friends they bought me like a joke Christmas present of um like calm down pills that were mints it was like take one of these because they're like because you're angry all the time and I was just like no I'm not I'm not am I no I'm not and I was so upset and even my reaction to it was so out of proportion to the act of friends giving you a joke we were all giving each other you know it was like oh okay and then my mum was poorly and I just started to feel so alone and I've got so many friends amazing friends and that's not a thing that's something I hear from people a lot that they're like I don't know why I feel like this I've got amazing friends and like, it's not about your friends it's not about you being a bad friend them being a bad friend it's it's you and like you deserve the help and I just remember being in New York, again, like it looks from the outside, this huge success, glamorous life, really exciting, got everything I could ever have wished for. And I had a sinus infection and I had to go to the doctor in New York, which was expensive because obviously we have to pay for all our healthcare here and stuff like that, which again, stops people from getting the help they need. Um, and I didn't have the insurance for the antibiotics he prescribed me and it was like $80 to pay for them. And I just remember going home with this $80 bottle of antibiotics and laying on the bed and just sobbing and being like if I, it, it went from literally being like I can't believe I've got a sinus infection to no one would care if I wasn't here in like zero to 60 just in no time and it was literally that moment that I was like this isn't right like that's not healthy and and I had friends who were in therapy and thank god I did have one person that I reached out to and I was just like can you refer me to your therapist because I just feel like I need somebody to talk to and that's how that journey started and it's like the greatest thing I've ever done for myself is go and do it and it was so hard and the only reason I sucked to it at the beginning was because she had an amazing dog and I fully was like I get to go and see the dog I get to go and see a King Charles Cavalier not go and see Cavalier and he was, but like a Cocker Spaniel type dog every week Enzo he was amazing um but it was like the stupidest things that kept me going in the beginning when it was so hard and I just think yeah it was like I felt so guilty that I and I remember family members when I told them saying to me like what you think you're special so you've got to go and tell someone how sad you are and I was like opposite actually <laughs> it's like actually I think I'm not special and I have to go and ask someone if I'm special because like I feel like poop and I feel like I should feel amazing so it's like I, yeah it took me so long to realize that if I can feel like that it's not just me and if we can tell each other on the times we feel like that like we can help each other mm. so yay you for doing that um sorry that got really deep uh but yeah I just I just think we've got to I think it's important and like you said it does relate back to the book in a sense because the uh Roz in the book is very much like at a crossroads in her life where she just doesn't really seem to know who she is and it's she's someone who has always had a very clear sense of who she is and what she wanted and what she was going to do and then one thing happens to her that sort of pulls that out from underneath her and obviously it's dealt with in a rom-com fashion um with sh sh shenanigans and hilarity ensues but it's still about her trying to work out how she who and how she who she is and how she lives her life from like 
this day forward, um, which I think is something we all do at some point. Um, and that is actually something I wanted to talk about that uh, Paula mentioned last time we had a conversation was the relationships and the friendships in the book and something we've touched on a little bit, Liv mentioned the friendships, timelines running at different times. Like, is that something that you guys, I know it is, um, have had experience with? Um, Liv, would you like to start us off with your lovely draws? Oh yeah, me and my draws. Yeah, no, I mean, I think when I was reading the book, I was just, I think there's this, like, I think it's weird because I experienced that kind of crossroads period quite early um, when I was at going to university and I dropped out of university and that was the first time I felt like I was I started like slipping back from that kind of parallel that you feel like you and your friends are all running along when you're at school and sick form and then suddenly you get to like doing your A-levels and then suddenly all these like forks appear and then you're like oh this is weird because I've always had those bubbles and like the friendship groups and the comfort of like knowing when all my friends are free and what they're doing and knowing everyone's routine and what everyone's thinking and that kind of real intimacy and then suddenly everyone's doing different things and meeting new people and I think when I dropped oh sorry when I dropped out of university that was the first moment where I was like oh okay now things are going slightly differently and my friends are moving on without me and that, at that time I was with my husband but he was meeting new people and he was having a great time and I was like oh my god this is weird and I think from that point it just kind of it was almost an early lesson in that whole kind of shift that we start going into in the 20, your 20s and 30s where people are getting married or they're meeting new people and they're getting different jobs and like in the book obviously Roz like is referring to her past and like liking how things were and I think we all have that kind of rose tinted nostalgia sometimes and looking at the past and being like oh no I liked it then and obviously her friends are, re are often good at kind of the kind of balancing that and saying well actually what's going on now and without spoiling anything um but I feel like that just kind of gets further along when it comes to marriage and children and sometimes I mean Pony did an amazing tweet I'll, I know you'll, you might touch on it in a minute but like all, almost establishing that when you get to these phases it's having friends for different things and acknowledging that not every friend has to be for everything and when you when you spoke about that I was like yes because I think we, we can put so much va value on like certain friends to just have every have the answers to everything and have that support for everything but you do get to a point in adulthood where it's like okay that friend won't relate relate to that and that's fine like you can't put that on them but I'll, I'm gonna actually let you say about this because you articulated it beautifully and I feel like I'm just gonna be like blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you um yeah it's really funny because like when people ask me like how I do well on social media I like I literally just poop out thoughts like I don't I don't really think that, that <laughs> so good though. but it's just I, the really frustrating thing is I can't I can't boil it down to a formula because there's like no formula it's just no. like <laughs> Um, you're just but, dead clever. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but that okay so I, I can give you some so to explain what the tweet was like basically yeah it, it was along the lines of exactly what you've just said which was um, about realizing that um, you know the, 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 the sort of the, where the conflict and where the pain comes from within friendships is when you're holding on to something like really tightly and where your lives are kind of moving in different directions and um and and like we all go through like so many different transitions at different points in our lives and just not being aware of how to navigate those transitions or expecting everything to kind of still expecting your friendship circles to still be the same through those transitions is what actually causes like so much of that that sense of betrayal of loss of when actually it's it's not quite that at all it's actually that um, you know, without sort of resorting to cliches, it's just that in, in terms of like what you were saying earlier, Lindsay, which is um, you could be surrounded by lots of friends and feel alone, is that, you know, the crux of loneliness is basically feeling like you're not understood. Like there is a fundamental part of yourself that is not understood by people around you and it can be your friends and your family. So that's why you can still be alone if you're surrounded by loads of people. And actually, if you kind of do an inventory and you, if you also have friends as well as your old friends, but if you have newer friends and continue to make friends who actually represent where you are in your life, then you kind of you kind of constantly mitigate that sense of loneliness because rather than 
than just you know worrying about why your friends or being paranoid that your friends don't like you anymore that they don't want to spend time with you that actually you've got you've just got different interests and you know you when you have friends that actually reflect those interests and that's when you see feel seen and you feel less lonely and so on and the um the origin of that tweet basically came about through the the, the landscape of coronavirus which is where a lot of us have had to look at our friendships and um and you know kind of figure out like what friendships have really worked for us during that time and one of the things that i realized was that so, so i belong to a powerlifting team which is um really near me like geographically like it's about a you know 15 minute journey um in a bus down the road and i've kind of like made all of these friends through this team and my personal trainer is like now like one of like my closest friends as well as his wife so i kind of like got a bog off deal like with them <laughs> and um yeah so i got like two for the price of one and they're just and she is she is like one of the like biggest loves of my life at the moment and we've only been friends for about like 12 months but it was this it was a sense that I just felt so serene and so balanced for like the first time in a really, really long time because I've got people that are so funny that like the same films as me that, you know, have a lot of the similarities of like school friends, but they fundamentally represent where I currently am at in my life at the moment, which is someone. So for example, the biggest difference between me and a lot of my like older friends is that I don't have kids and they do. And and I noticed that there were like, you know, definitely a few years where things just felt very like uncertain and unsettled with them because, you know, especially like my female friends had like really small babies who, you know, um, it's, it's such a difficult time. Like when you have a small child yeah. and the amount of, yeah. So, so, and I kind of just felt like they needed something different and I needed something different. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that was a motorbike okay. uh, they were very keen to hear what you had to say yeah uh, so but, they've gone now uh, yeah, they just, agreed with you and they've left thank you thank you please thank them for me and take them on their way <laughs> oh um, he'll be back because he's yeah. always back but I will <laughs> but it was it was like a it was a very I, I didn't feel like anyone was benefiting from that and I felt like all we were just doing was trying to be friend, trying to be there for each other but also being slightly resentful and I don't think anyone should really feel resentful in a friendship you know yeah. yeah yeah no it's it's fascinating it's something that I really struggle with um with friendship groups because I've moved around quite a lot so like I grew up in South Yorkshire and then I moved to I went to uni in Nottingham and not many people from my class went to uni and it was I was going through my big high school boyfriend breakup thing as well so I sort of left with no one like maybe I kept one friend from school because it was a very small school very clicky it was well there was a lot of drama that's another chat for another time um, but I sort of moved on to the uni friends and then I moved to London straight after uni and again it was really hard to keep those super intense uni friendships because you're living together you're going through life together for the first time and then you're moving into London and going into work and it, it's, it's really really tricky and I've just again I'm like just tell, I'm telling everyone way too much I feel like and no members of my family are watching this so it's fine but my parents got divorced when I was really little and it was super traumatic like it was a something I worked through in therapy but it was like a big my therapist will call it a big t trauma um because the actual act of my dad leaving was like I was there I physically was there when he left the room and was like I'm leaving and it was like I was eight and couldn't process it. and I was like what are you what, what like you don't leave like parents don't leave and I think I've then spent a lot of my life trying to like keep everybody and be like, if you just behave, if you just do exactly what they want and be exactly what they want and do everything, they will stay and everyone will love you and it will be fine. And it took me a really long time to accept that some friendships just grow and change and some will go away and not in a bad way. They don't have to end. And I was like, all relationships have to end in trauma because that's what I learned from so young. And it's like, they don't. Sometimes you just grow and change and move away. And sometimes they'll come back and some people are in your life forever and they just pop in and out. And some people will just like be by your side, whether you want them there or not. Uh, like, you know, it's just, there's all these different versions of friendship and they're all valid. And I just think that's for a lot of women, that's really hard to get. Cause again, like I know my, my example of it was very specific, but I think as women, we are trained to be people pleasers and be likable and to have people enjoy us. You know, we're like, we're supposed to be there to entertain and, and comfort and nurture 
And if we're not doing that, we feel guilty. So I think then when if a friendship doesn't work out or if you feel, if you feel lonely, you feel like it's something you've done instead of just the natural course of things, which is really tricky. I mean, obviously you talk about this a lot in Insecure Girls Club as well, live with friendships and the patterns of friendships. And it must be, is it something you see coming up a lot with the different people you interview? massively I think everyone kind of carries that worry and especially with friendships on different scales everyone's kind of grappling with like keeping people happy or like I mean I'm a serial people pleaser and it's something I definitely need to work on um and it's something I've become more aware of so I'm more mindful of it and sometimes I'm just like okay like it's not it's about setting boundaries and also respecting what you want and not having to like bend over backwards to keep everyone else happy apart from yourself and but I think it is something that yeah like you say we're we're a kind of conditioned to feel and just programmed to kind of be like not ever rock the boat or not ever bring anything up or just try and just keep things comfortable and I think that's something especially with friendships that often that's where I've gone wrong potentially is by not bringing things up if there is an issue of contention by having an adult conversation because I'm like oh no no that's not what uh, what you should do because you don't want to upset anyone and actually that becomes like a part of like resentful and that kind of becomes that kind of like niggly feeling where you're like oh okay now I'm feeling annoyed because I didn't just have an adult conversation with somebody about why i I think they've been a bit of a flaky friend or something silly like that because you're just like, oh, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. And it's almost just being like lots of people have kind of said similar things, but it's just being able to address that and actually go, no, no, it's okay to have these conversations. And I've had a con- I've had conversations in the past with friends which have taught me that in a way where I've had friends say, oh, you've been really like rubbish with texting back or you've not, you've been a bit unreliable. And actually at the time I was kind of like, oh, me like oh god but actually it's like being able to have those adult conversations that mean you can go no no you're 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 completely right and thank you for telling me that and actually being able to accept that and not always be like a huge slight on your personality or like this huge thing which you're like oh drama like I'm an awful person it's not about that it's just creating like that comfort between friends where you can have those conversations and it not be like this I'm bad you're good just being able to have like I don't know take people pleasing out of it almost I've just had it would eat me alive forever (laughs) oh oh tell us your epiphany (laughs) um I used to be a people pleaser and I always think of myself as a people pleaser and I'm not a people pleaser anymore because yeah sorry this is I I don't worry I'll 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 (laughs) for the unofficial therapy (laughs) But, but yeah, because I, I, I was thinking about this while you were talking, Liv, and I was like, actually, yeah, I can think of many examples in the last two years that where I haven't, and, and where it became most apparent. So I, um, I became part of a new um, uh, female group of friends. Uh, this is kind of in the last 18 months. And what I noticed my function in that group was basically to say when I didn't want to do something because like everyone else didn't really <laughs> want to do it either and they were just being really polite and they were <laughs> around because they didn't want to and I was like no I'm not going to do that like I'm really I'm either really tired I'm really hungry I want to go home like and so so actually what, but but and, I, and while you were talking I was like okay but how did I get there like how did the magic happen yeah please <laughs> tell us <laughs> look at me a little bit please <laughs> please <laughs> Yeah, I'm the worst. I'm so afraid. bad. Oh, I've got. A, yeah, I'm trying. I do try. Yeah. There was a quote in um, the Oprah magazine. This is like we're going deep now. There was a quote in the Oprah magazine once. I read it at, like in a doctor's office or something. But it was like, um, does your answer? If someone's asking you a question, does the answer feel like freedom or a trap? So okay. it's like if it doesn't make you feel free, like the, if someone asks you a question and your answer doesn't make you feel free if it feels like you're talking yourself into a trap just don't do it and I remember sitting there reading going like what nonsense I'm like of course of course I feel terrible because of course I'm whatever this person wants I'm going to give it to them at great personal cost to myself um and it really did make me think but I still have to do get to the part where I am no longer I am getting better at like trying to say no or say or pushing back on saying like well can we do it at this time or um one thing I've done that I think has really helped is like when I write an email, I don't send it until I go back and take out all of the words that make it sound like I'm trying to possibly maybe kind of positionist of maybe it's okay. Instead of saying, this is what I want to do. I'd be like, maybe, 
we could do it this way and we could try. And now I'm getting better at saying this is what I want to do. And that was really hard because I could just imagine someone reading it going like, what does she think she is with these opinions and requests? And they're perfectly polite emails. But before they would have been like, I was thinking from my point of view, perhaps maybe it would work if we tried it this way just the one time. What do you all think? And it's like, no, we've got to be better at being like, this is what we want and need. Porn has done it. So <laughs> There is home. The queen. I was like, oh my God, you've just read one of my emails out loud. And I'm like, okay. I feel like there's like, this is the up before and the after. <laughs> I was like, porn. I am 39. I'm 39 and I've just kind of started beginning to do it. So I think like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not okay. We need, to, we've got to do it. Like we've got to, it's, I remember in school, we did like an assertiveness class once in PGCE and everyone was like, the fuck is this? Um, but I'm like, I do genuinely think back to it, which is so weird because I remember so little of school. Um, but I remember that assertiveness class and the teacher trying to teach us the difference between being passive, assertive and aggressive. And yet, despite getting that education at 15, really have hung around in that passive aggressive zone for like a really long time. Really felt like that was my wheelhouse where I felt most comfortable. The idea of doing a class on assertiveness has made my hands go a bit clammy. <laughs> yeah, it was stupid. Like the, it wasn't stupid. It was amazing, but it was terrible. But um, the head, it was the head teacher was taking it as well. So it was like a lot of pressure. Um, she would come up with a hypothetical situation and then you had to like ask for a thing. Or, or respond to a thing but like by being assertive and, and if you were passive or aggressive she would go eh! at the top of her voice so you just like I just want to die like I just want to die I want no part of this validation is very important to me and I hate this um but again as a people pleaser I did pick it up quite quickly for the purposes of the cat the class <laughs> and then just threw it right out the window like that was the best part like you were like, like I, I excelled at this 45 minutes <laughs> But that's my worst, that's one of my worst things. Like I will, I'm very adaptable and I know that. And um, I have possibly unhealthy wells of empathy where I can very easily put myself in someone else's shoes, even when they're people whose shoes do not deserve to be put in. Um, and I'll be like, but I understand how they got to this point and I could totally rationalize on their behalf how they got here. And then once I've done that, I can start trying to make excuses for their terrible behavior. And I'm like, no, gotta stop it, gotta stop. No excuses, only assertiveness. We should all be more porno. I'm going to get a what would porno do tattoo. That's going to be my 10th tattoo <laughs> that Jeff says I can't have. <laughs> Jeff put his foot down for the first time in six and a half years. Um, I think that's it. I think that's the goal. Thanks, Paula. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> You've I'm destroyed sorry, my marriage. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> I'm so like, this has been so cathartic. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? I'm having the nicest time. I'm like, we need to start answering Q&A, but I'm like, no, um, <laughs> we will, we will. Um, I did just have one thing I wanted to touch on because it's an email that Paula sent me earlier, which was amazing, which is from a CMOI Strong um, member of the group. And like, I probably had a, a brief moment where I was already quite emotional. Taylor Swift, y'all. Um, and like, then you pushed me right over the edge with this email. But if you want to tell us a little about the email and then we'll talk about it in relation to the book. So I think it, it ties in a bit. Yeah, so there is a um, plus size ballet dancer. Um, she does it for fun. Uh, you know, this is like a thing that's just really joyous for her. And she posted a video of her going um, on point in ballet shoes. And, um, and she got trolled really, really badly. Like people saying, you know, uh, you're not actually on point. Um, you know, you're, you're too fat to support your own body weight to be able to do that. Like just hideous comments, right? And um, I took a couple of uh, things that she'd put on her social media and I reposted it on See My Strong and basically just said, because um, she did this like amazing thing where someone had written this horrible comment saying, you, you can't, it's, it's physically impossible for you to get on point. And then the, like the next picture is of her actually going on point. Just <laughs> <laughs> so um, well, I did this post and, you know, um, just said, look, she's kind of amazing. And then she got in touch and just said, thank you for this. Cause this actually, like she said, you know, I just got trolled really badly. And I didn't realize she'd gotten trolled, you know, when I had reposted this picture. And um, so what I kind of asked my community to do, so I'm looking down cause I just wanted to actually pull up her response. Um, what I asked my community to do was to support her, uh, to kind of just like offer a different narrative to the one that we always expect, you know, as women who put ourselves out there on social media, because to me, it was unacceptable that someone was, you know, posting about their achievements, something that half 
if not most of these people can't even do, you know, even if they, they tried their hardest. And there was this unbelievable outpouring of like love, but I, I didn't know whether she'd seen the comments. I didn't, I didn't, you just don't know with these things. And she just yeah. wrote this comment, which was, I've never received so much love from a community before. I feel super emotional writing this. It's just so lovely to see. I appreciate your page and what it stands for so much. And I appreciate all of your unbelievably kind members. Thank you again. And it just, because the thing is, I can, I can say stuff and I can support people and I can protect them and I can do everything I can possibly can, but I can't vouch for other people. I just have to hope that the, um, you know, the community that I've created will do me proud and be able to say things in the right way. And they just did. And it was just, it was just amazing. It was just an amazing thing to see. Like, look how amazing it is when we help each other <laughs> and take care of each other instead of shitting on each other it's a wild (laughs) idea that's out there um yeah when I when you sent me that email I was firstly like as I did a small cry and then secondly it just really got me thinking because I broke my own rule last night and watched a review of in case you missed it don't just Mm. don't engage with reviews because it's a terrible idea um but it was by a youtuber that I know and I really love her and I was like you know I'm genuinely interested in her opinion like I have so much so put so much stock in what she thinks and the review in general made me so happy because she There's a thing with books, and you've both written books, so I'd be curious to get your take on this, but my feeling when I'm writing is there's an idea of what I want the piece to be, whether it's a book or an essay or whatever, in my head where I see it entirely, like it's a little golden ball and it's perfect, so I know exactly what it is. But then translating that onto the page is like an entirely different process. And it's like, maybe you get like a watercolor painting version of that perfect image in your head, or maybe you get like, an artistic you know rendition you, you never really quite capture it exactly how it wants to be um and in case you missed it is the first book since basically my first one where I think oh no this is like I think it's pretty much what I wanted it to be and one of the things that the person mentioned in the review is that and it wasn't even something that I thought that much about which made me think when I saw your email like this is something we've got to be thinking about all the time when we're put, committing things to paper and making stuff is that she's like, oh, it felt like it looks like my world, that there were different um, sexualities in there. There were older people in the book that have a full sex life. There are young YouTubers that are making tons of money and not everyone is obsessed with their weight and all that stuff. And I think it made me think when I first started writing women's fiction and when I was reading women's fiction sort of 15 years ago, and there was that emphasis on your character was a slim beautiful but didn't know it white straight woman and her only goal was to fall in love and how that's changed now to being I mean I'm I am a mostly straight white woman so I'm like I can only really tell my story I would never put my put someone else's story on the page that's not mine to tell but I think it's really important to me to show characters in a world that looks like my world because if I don't do that and the idea that someone would pick up my book and someone like you know this amazing ballet dancer who has incredible in men again um amazing skills that i could only dream of like i don't want someone like that to be able to pick up that book and not find themselves in it in whatever that means and it you know it's not always going to be the lead character there's a whole other conversation we need to have about representation in especially in romance but in fiction and literary fiction and all fiction um because that's something that's changing and i do think it's changing now for the better thank god but i would I just, it made me like feel so cringy immediately that I'm like, God, have I written something that's shut someone out ever? The idea of closing a door. And I was like, oh my God, I just really hope I've never done it. And thankfully, like, thank God for that one review that I did watch. I'm like, well, at least I feel like I feel good about this book that some people can find themselves in there, no matter who they are or how they relate to it. But yeah, it's just like, we've got to start doing better at looking after each other and not shitting on each other (laughs) like it's that shouldn't be hard should it is it weird that that is difficult I don't get it Liv you're nodding I like it I just I feel like that it's like (laughs) it's like yeah no it's just just lots of yeses no because I do feel especially online it is that it's it sounds it is so simple and I think like like you like you'll say you say porn like just it is simple to support people and like it's such you think it is and then I think actually when you can create a community of people that are just all genuinely looking out for each other and wanting to uplift other people 
it shouldn't it's it's it shouldn't be surprising but it is and I think that's sometimes a bit like what but it's such an incredible and valuable thing to have because you know you've, you've attracted these people that all have this thing in common and this and that's made like that's so many things but it's the interest and it's also kindness and it's also this empathy with people and just being able to just like you even like you were saying Lindsay and being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes for a bit and I know that sometimes we can all like take that too far but I think being able to have that in you and actually understand and say okay that experience looks different to mine but I can understand why that person needs support and why like we all have a place to do it and we have a platform to do it um but yeah no like you say it's just it shouldn't it shouldn't it should be commonplace to do that but it's not yeah. always and that's it's wild isn't it yeah I was I saw a comment yesterday <laughs> again let's pivot back to professional wrestling the place where I'm most comfortable but it was an interview with these two wrestlers and I've interviewed these guys before and loved them um but they're both like old school professional wrestlers they're from the Carolinas they were raised in the southern United States so people have sort of a preconception about how they might feel about certain things and obviously Black Lives Matter movement has just like it's on fire it's I mean <laughs> parts of America are literally on fire we're trying to figure stuff out like it's important but they had been asked an interview um they asked a question and people expected a certain response from them and they immediately shut it down and they were just like this is not okay like we do not stand for that a lot of our fans are from where we're from where certain things are taught but we will not further it. And the thing they said was um, they weren't taught to hate, but they weren't taught not to. And I think that was such a catch all. They were talking about it res with response to racism, but I think it, it covers everything. It covers anywhere where you might find yourself on the wrong side of the fence about how you treat someone. It's like, yeah, you might not have been taught to do this by your family, but you weren't taught not to do it. And you've got to teach yourself. You've got to take responsibility for making those changes. And um, yeah, no one told you to post shitty comments, but no one told you not to post because shitty comments. So it's like, I'm telling you not to post shitty comments. Your heart is telling you not to post shitty comments. And I just think it was such a lesson that is a really easy one to learn. Mm. There's just like, it, yeah. it, when I saw those comments on that photo corner, I just, I was so happy. Like it just, like it took someone two seconds and yeah. that woman is going to have like the greatest day of her life now instead of the worst. And yeah. it, it was amazing. And I love it. And, um, it made me really happy. Um, I'm going to move on to the questions cause we've only got like 10 minutes left. Um, so we have got some questions from people watching. Um, first one, this is a tricky one. If you had to choose one social media platform to use forever, which would it be? No one wants to answer it. <laughs> oh, we missed that. What was that? Instagram. Instagram. I feel like until this morning I would have said Instagram and then I like my TikTok algorithm started to favor me and I'm getting like <laughs> Mamma Mia um like <laughs> just all like the stupid stuff I really like at the moment I'm getting in abundance and I'm like this is brilliant I've, I'm like part of it now like just dogs and mamma mia so I'm like I probably would say TikTok but um that that well, that is subject to change I'd probably say Instagram it's fair I've also sort of engaging with TikTok and it my feed is now just all cats it's just all cats it's just hundreds and hundreds of cats cats and ferrets who knew there was a ferrets of TikTok tag I encourage everyone to, to discover it my friend was like well now the Chinese know everything about you I'm like I'm pretty sure the Chinese know everything about all of us anyway the Chinese I'm like that's a very catch-all sketchy statement to be making I am an American now I just feel like it's it's a it's a bigger problem uh big fan of TikTok I I would really struggle between Twitter and Instagram because Twitter was where the wrestling fans are the wrestling fans are all on Twitter yeah. um but that comes with negativity uh, built in. So probably would end up on Instagram. Good for Instagram. It's, See, it's, yeah, it's a win for Instagram. I mean, I, for Instagram. I engage with Twitter though a lot more than I engage with Instagram. So I don't know, I want, I want both, but Twitter, you, yeah. you try and like, you, the thing that irritates me about Twitter is that you could, you could say the funniest joke and there will always be someone who craps on your joke. And that's the thing that just kills me. Like this it happened to me funny. today, I posted, yeah, I posted something that was a joke and then someone replied to it with like, a, just a very 
detailed reply. And I was like, no, I know. That's why, that's why it's a joke. Yeah. You've responded with the factual response to this. And it's like, but that's why it was a joke. Like, and I'm just like, and of course the reply guys who I always enjoy, which, you know, if you like wrestling and you dare to tweet about wrestling and you identify as a woman, you have, you've set yourself up. But I've just started to reply to those people by saying, you seem nice. Are you having a good day? And then muting them forever. And I feel like it's all I can do. You can't block them because that's what they want. Um, but I'm just like, you all right? You, you're okay over there. It just feels like you're not mute. Um, next one. How do you invite kindness and happiness into your life? It's a lovely question. I struggle like, with it. I, <laughs> that's how I do it. Like, that's what, we're all like, like, I don't know. Yeah, we're like, um, I'm like, by having a Toblerone at the side of me and like two cats in the other room. That's, it's a hard one though, isn't it? It's a hard say, one. To actively bring happiness into your life. Like, um, I, I mean, Okay, I could I could probably do this quite quickly. I think that kindness and happiness. So happiness for me is um, is having a think about stuff that doesn't make me happy. So the word I the word I use because I'm in the twelve step. <laughs> I'm afraid is serenity because I find that serenity as a word is just it's just more accurate than happiness. Um, so anything that kind of uh, tries to detract from that or consistently takes away from that, I just kind of I I snip snip that stuff out of my life quite easily um, and tend to want to have my life being a reflection of things that I actually want to do uh, and so on. And I would just say kindness is um, it's you practice what you preach and you, you help out other people and you try and be a good person um, and you try and help other people when they're down. And also, uh, but for me, I do have uh, the other side to that, which is, yeah, like, you know, I, I just don't tolerate people who aren't kind. Like, people who are assholes just don't get, they don't get a look <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. I'm just like, all I want to do is now refer to you for every question I might have about life. And I feel quite bad about it because you've opened yourself up to like some real issues. You've opened yourself up to waking up to a lot of text messages if what you've done here. I'm like, oh my God, you could just have your life be a reflection of the things you enjoy. What the? <laughs> I had no like, idea you could do that. I want to be like, can I say that? That that. <laughs> that <laughs> I'm, I'm forty in October. I will be forty in October. I'm literally like, you can do that. Like, I feel like the Little Mermaid. I'm like, <gasps> like and I'm just like, I don't have like, 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 assholes. I'm amazing. Like, <laughs> game changer. Game changer. Um, Liv, how do you invite kindness and happiness into your life? That. Nothing you can say will be good now. Nothing you can say will be good. Literally that. I know. I was just like, (laughs) I mean, like, (laughs) just that. Um, Kindness. Yeah. All I'm going to do is word it in a less good way. (laughs) (laughs) That's what men have been doing for decades. So don't worry about it. Just repeating what the really clever woman said, just in more words. It works for them. Um, no, I think with kindness, it's just, it's, it's like age old, like treating people as you'd like to be treated and just trying your best and not dwelling on every time you've ever done something wrong and just trying to do better every day. And Again, to- I'm like, yeah, how are we doing that? I'm still upset with myself about something I said to someone on the last day of university in the first year. I and it's like, it, it haunts me. It haunts I, me. This is something I think I learned over lockdown because I feel like I've, I'm always someone that beats myself up about things that have happened in the past. And like, I don't know, I was like talking to someone. I was like, oh my God, I think I was shitty to someone in like year six. I was like, should I message her? And I was like, no, (laughs) No. ever do that. She's moved on. Absolutely not. She's happy. Like she does not need, like, and it's like, (laughs) I don't forgive myself when I'm actually, I'm like, you wouldn't do it now. If you wouldn't do it now, move on. You're better than that. You've taken the lesson. Be kind. Like, it's just all we can do is do better every day and just learn from our mistakes and not dwell on them. Um, And happiness wise, um, oh, she's just what Paula said um but (laughs) but I do do you know recently I was talking to one of my friends about this because I'd had a really shitty couple of days and she was like you should have a mental health toolkit and I was like oh I like this and she was just like write down all the things that you do and they make you feel really happy and this sounds really basic um but there were things I was like oh I'd watch like Miss Americana and I felt so good after watching it and I was like I could do that I could listen to Heim's new album there's like certain things that I just now have I'm like okay if I'm having a shitty day 
they're the things I'll pull out and whether that's I don't know like this this is lame this is so lame what I'm about to say but like cleaning the house with a, an amazing soundtrack on or just doing things that like just take me away from anything they're kind of smaller things see I told you it'd be less good than your yeah. answer no it was good you were good and I'm now going to steal your answer because mine's very similar is my whenever I'm well most of the time I'm stressed or anxious or having a bad time it's it's me in my head and I've got to get myself out my head. So my two options are, which one is not an option for me right now, which is go to the gym and pick up heavy things and put them down, which makes me feel incredible because it does not require my brain in the slightest. It requires me to be entirely engaged with my body and know what's happening physically so I can just put the rest of it down. I have got a hex bar. I bought a trap bar. So I've got a bar to lift, but I couldn't get any plates. Like there are no weight plates. So I'm just picking up and putting down a bar, but it's keeping my form in check. So that's important. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, to just try and switch off and do a thing. Like I got Disney Plus when it launched here and I've been working my way through The Simpsons from the start. And it's like, because it's not just happy because it's funny and clever. And I actually think watching funny, clever things helps with my writing because it comes back. Um, but also it's super nostalgic for me and reminds me of like when I was watching it with my brother when we were like 12 and it makes me really happy. Um, but it is trickier than it should be. To, like look after your own happiness it really shouldn't be that hard should it taylor swift can't release an album for me every day this is the problem <laughs> this is the issue. i'm putting i'm making it her fault um, i'm making it her problem we have to wrap up because it's eight o'clock this is insane this is mental um we had a few more questions so i'll post a couple of them on twitter and we'll reply to you there uh but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Porna and Liv for this most thank amazing you. conversation that I now genuinely want to go out and like punch a thing in a good way. <laughs> like I probably want to go out and be like, who needs anything? I can probably do it badly. But like, I feel amazing. This was so good. Thank you guys. It's thank been fun having us. Thank you. And thank you. It's like, I'm like, I'm gonna, I can't get a Taylor Swift album every day. I can't get a book every day, but this was the best celebration. I'm being told to hold this up. <laughs> this is out now. This is why we're chatting. <gasps> yeah. I don't have the paper. Um, it's all very exciting. I have the digital. I'm, I'm trying to pass it over to you, but it won't. Oh, it won't work. The internet is a lie. The internet oh, is a I lie. I love that sort of work. <laughs> I know, do you imagine? Oh my God, there's a TikTok. Um, stop it, Lindsay, stop it. Uh, but no, thank you so much, everyone that joined us. Thank you to Porna and Liv. Um, you, where can they find you online? Porna, where can everyone find you? Um, I'm at Porna Bell on Twitter and Instagram. And Liv? Oh, I'm Liv Purvis on Twitter and Instagram also. Your names, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Wild and crazy. Oh, and um, if you're not uh, already following them, please do. My strong yes. is at be my strong as well at see my strong and insecure girls club is the insecure girls club there we go i do enjoy it when things are logical it's my favorite thing um we're gonna wrap up thank you so 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 much to everyone uh, that has messaged me today for everyone that was involved in this chat today i hope you have enjoyed it you know we have or i have <laughs> we have we have we <laughs> thank you so much and um i will see you all again soon Bye.